Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace are yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As a young girl, my great-grandmother, Orcelia, was struck down with polio. Born in 1898, she was afflicted with the disease early on in her years as her body was growing. And as a result, by the time she reached the age of eight or nine, the polio had stopped her left leg from developing. It would remain, for the remainder of her life, short, skinny, and deformed. It was about that time when the doctors told her parents and her something that was quite devastating. They said, we'll doubt that she'll ever learn to walk. We also doubt that she'll ever have children. But my grandma Orcelia hated that word doubt, and she hated sitting in the family living room while the world passed her by. So one day, as the story goes, she crawled into the backyard, and she pulled herself up onto a tree, and when she had steadied herself on the tree, she took a step, and she immediately fell down. So she turned around, and she crawled back up the tree, steadied herself, and repeated the process. So one step turned to two steps, turned to three steps, and eventually she taught herself how to walk. And for a woman who was never supposed to be able to walk or have children, she went on to be a farm wife, hauling water in from the well to be heated on the stove and working in the garden, and she birthed six children, living to the age of 84 all because she kept going back to the tree in the face of that temptation that she would never be able to do any of it. Temptation plays an interesting role in our lives, and as we uncover in this morning's gospel text, all temptation takes its root in Satan. It's interesting that this text comes immediately after Jesus' baptism. After we had Jonah baptized, our closest friends and family shared a meal together. But right here in Matthew, it says that out of the waters of the river Jordan, Jesus was driven, not to a cake that was awaiting in the fellowship hall, but into the wilderness, a dangerous place where the rules of society don't apply and anything can happen. And he's there for 40 days and 40 nights, the same amount of time Noah and his family were tossed about on the ark during the flood. The same amount of time the people of Israel waited for Moses to come back down with the law. The same amount of time Goliath taunted the Israelites before David came to knock him down. Forty years, God's people wandered in the wilderness before coming into the promised land. There's something about that number 40 as it comes up in the biblical narrative. And almost always, it is associated with feeling the stress of humanity. Can you imagine the angst that Noah must have felt as the rain started to pour and he could hear the pounding of his friends and family on the door outside the ark asking to be let in? During the 40 days that Moses was up on Mount Sinai with God, the recently freed Israelites started stressing out and questioning if Moses was ever going to come back down and lead them. So what did they do? Well, they had Aaron make them a golden calf idol to worship. Time and time again, That number 40 is correlated to dealing with the full weight and pressure of life. And Jesus' 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness are no exception to this, for in the wilderness, Satan comes to join him. Now, anytime Satan shows up on the scene, doubt, temptation, and confusion, these three things are going to follow him, because these three things are what Satan lives to churn up. Doubt in God's word temptation to worship him, and confusion that what God has given us is not truly enough. As we heard in our Old Testament reading this morning, this has always been Satan's arsenal. He leads Adam and Eve to doubt that God actually told them to avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He tempted them to eat of the tree anyways because God really didn't mean that they would die, right? And he confused their identity as creatures saying that if they ate of the fruit, they would have God's knowledge and that they would see the world as God does. 
God had given Adam and Eve the most amazing promise. You are my special creation. I have given you to one another in full companionship all the days of your life. I will provide for your every need. You will live here in harmony with one another and with me, and death will have no place here. And no sooner after the promise was given, Satan slithers onto the scene to cast doubt on what God has made certain. And because Satan's bag of tricks is shallow, and this is all he knows how to do, he employs the same tactic on Christ. God gives an amazing promise to Christ in his baptismal waters. This is my child, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And what Satan hates more than anything else in the world is God's promise for his chosen people. And that includes you. So he goes to great lengths to call God's promises into question. The misconception that we often work under is because of God's love for us and because we are God's children, we are immune from suffering or even temptations of this old world. That because God has chosen us, we can avoid the full weight and pressure of humanity and the stress of living in a broken world. Well, that won't apply to us. But in all actuality, after our head is pat dry when we leave the baptismal font, and after the cake in the fellowship hall has all been eaten, we are actually carried and then start walking right into the path of the evil one. And as Jesus, as he had in his wilderness experience we read of this morning, it can feel isolating and it can feel lonely as if we have nowhere else to turn. As Jesus encountered, when Satan comes calling, it will feel as if we have no escape from the burdens that are placed upon us because Satan is actually very sneaky and very crafty when pulling out doubt and temptation and confusion. And his favorite word in his weaponal arsenal is that word, if. Go back and read Satan's shots at Christ. If you are the Son of God... You will make bread for yourself. If you are the Son of God, He will save you from death when you throw yourself off the top of the temple. If you bow down and worship me here, you can have the entire world right here and right now. Do you see what He's doing? First, Satan casts doubt that God is going to provide daily bread, that God actually won't give Jesus all he needs to survive in the wilderness. And second, he tempts Jesus to put God on trial and make him prove himself as the protector of his people. Third, he confuses the salvation plan that God set in motion when he sent Christ to earth. Worship me now, Satan says, and we can avoid the cross, and we can avoid the suffering and the shame altogether. You won't even have to go there. But doesn't Satan do the same thing for us today? Did God really say that he would give you all the daily bread that you need? Did God really say that he would provide for every single one of your needs? If God really loved you, he wouldn't have allowed your mother to die of cancer. If God really loved you, he would not allow you to lose your job. Did God really say that you should remain faithful to your spouse? Doesn't God want you to be happy? Did God really call you his child in the waters of baptism? How do you know that you actually belong to him? If God is really there, why is the coronavirus on the rampage? If God cared about you, he would allow you to be financially stable. But let's stop for a moment and look at how Christ combated Satan and eventually sent him fleeing. He went back to the word. Every rebuttal he came and gave to the evil one in the wilderness comes out of scripture. He says, it is written. So we can say, the word tells me that God crafted me and knit me together in the womb of my mother and that in my baptism, I have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit marked with the cross of Christ and promised eternal life, period. The word tells me that just as God fed the Israelites in the wilderness with manna and quail, that he will provide everything that I need, and he will provide all of the daily bread that I pray for in the Lord's Prayer. The word tells me that cancer has been absorbed in the cross of Christ, because even in death, the victory over disease will come in the resurrection. The word tells me that my worth before God is not based on what's in my bank account 
but upon the precious spilled blood of Jesus Christ. The word says that Christ will never leave or forsake me. And in the face of doubt and temptation and confusion, this is what I keep going back to. Like my great-grandmother Orcelia, who pulled herself onto the trunk of the tree and crawled her way back every time she fell down and needed to be lifted up again, so too we crawl back every time to the promises made in this book because we know that they are for us. And we return every day to the waters of our baptism because we know that God's promise was given here to us. But here's the greatest promise that we heard today. It came right at the end of our Genesis reading, and you'd almost miss it if you weren't looking for it. Right after Satan tempted our first parents to fall into sin, God looked at Satan in the garden and said, you will not be around to do this forever. For from the family of Adam and Eve, I am sending one who is going to crush you with his heel. And during this season of Lent, this is what we look forward to. That moment on the cross when Christ fulfills the greatest promise ever made, Satan, doubt, temptation, confusion, they all meet their end at Golgotha. So trust the word. Be sustained by the word. Crawl back to and steady yourself on the word because God's promises are here and they are here for you. Amen.